Welcome back everyone, Pal Ponder on Weather here. We're really going to expand the view this morning and give you an overview of really what's happening so you can see the big picture. If we zoom in here closer to the U.S., you can see this steady stream of moisture. So those areas across the south are being inundated with very heavy rainfall. Numerous flood warnings and flood watches are in place. And as well as the West Coast is also getting pummeled with heavier rain. But look what's also hanging out west into the Pacific Ocean there. That steady stream of moisture with lining up across the board with one, two, three systems yet to come ashore. And that is going to continue to moving eastbound. And as we head into that February time slot, that's when things start to get really active. So... Buckle up, folks. We're in for a wild wide as I take you through the setup over the next couple of weeks. So I appreciate all my subscribers out there. This channel is up to 235,000 subscribers. I appreciate each and every one of you. I'm here on a daily basis throughout 2024. I put out a lot of content. In fact, about 27 videos a month. So come back on a daily basis and I'll give you a full update on what's to come to keep you well ahead of the storm so let's take you back of where we came from first because yes we had two series of arctic blasts that came through over the course of that seven to ten day stretch and this setup mainly unfolded across east of the continental divide there but mention the united states if you added it all up we actually came out of the coldest third week of january and about 30 years for the lower 48. So we've seen an extended cold snap across the lower 48. Now we're coming out of that. And so when you come out of that, we get the flush out effect. We had the extreme on the downside. Now we get the rapid surge on the north side. So this is the setup for the next week as temperatures are going to be rapidly rebounding. Uh, those warmer anomalies really start to encompass a good part of the lower 48 and much of the upper Great Lakes and into Canada, we could actually be even seeing some record high temperatures unfolding, if you can actually believe that. So looking at the snowpack, we laid down some pretty good snows across the last couple of weeks. And this is your current snowpack right now. All those areas in blue do in fact have snow on the ground. But that's going to be a concern with all the rain that's hitting that area now and the rapid warm up. So that means a lot of that snow is going to be slowly melting as you continue to warm up, you know, as we get into the last half of later into January and going into February. So if you look at the precipitation right now, just for the last three days, we had that first atmospheric river event that pummeled the West Coast with very heavy rainfall and that's when san diego saw all that massive flooding with over three inches of rain for them just in one day which is actually the most they've seen in a one day period in january since 1850 folks so this is an extreme event that hit the west coast and then you had that all that moisture coming from the deep tropics down there in the caribbean now that's lifting northbound. So for the last three days, they've seen a lot of flooding down here in South Texas into East Texas. And now that is surging northward, running into that snowpack, right? And that's when all the rain on top of some of that snow melt is going to cause some flooding even up there in the portions of Iowa, getting into Illinois and Indiana. And this is what's to come. So this is the rainfall that's not happened yet. This is over the course of the next week to end the month of January. So we still have those series of those atmospheric river events. We've got them all lined up across the Pacific Ocean, just waiting to come on shore. So between now and the next seven days, we've got another influx of precipitation hitting the West Coast into Washington and Oregon into Northern California. It hits the mountain regions, hitting that warmer air. So you have that drier slot, but then you got the warm Pacific, Pacific you know, Gulf moisture 
coming out of that more active subtropical jet stream. So on top of the precipitation you've already seen across this region, this is additional precipitation and these amounts can be an extreme in itself. So yeah, those areas in Louisiana could pick up another eight to 10 inches of rainfall just in the next seven days, folks. And all those areas in the darker reds easily pick up four to six inches of rain anywhere from East Texas to Southeast Texas, through Louisiana, into Mississippi, into Alabama, through Georgia, and upwards to, into Tennessee and Kentucky, even up towards there could pick up two to four inches. But again, once you start hitting this corridor with all that snow on the ground, all that is going to eventually slowly start to melt. So in combination of that rainfall that will be you know, falling, in this uh, atmosphere into those in that low land land masses that's going to be concerned with the one two punch effect with the rain and then the snow melt on top of it is going to be causing those rivers to rise and you could have some river floodings up here across these regions but looking at the el nino so with this all kind of started because the El Nino would take you way back. It was June the 8th. That's when it first classified as an El Nino. This is the trend over the last three months. At one point, we did, in fact, hit strong criteria. Looking at this is about 1.8. Uh, anywhere from any, anywhere to a 1.0 is an El Nino. Once you get to 1.5, it's classified as a strong El Nino. And that's exactly where we first could start to get classified as a strong El Nino back around Thanksgiving time frame. And you can see it started dipping a little bit, but it actually spiked up again once we got towards New Year's Eve time frame. And that's when it peaked. That's when they said, hey, this is anywhere, this is could be on the cusp of a super El Nino. Now it's been on the downslide, right? We almost hit had like a, a double top there, right? It's almost like trade the market, you see? So it hit a double top. And once that second top hit, and then you got the, the flush out effect, what we're seeing now. So we're seeing the weakening trend of the El Nino. And it's even lower than what we saw back on November the 15th as we're getting the slow weakening phase of that El Nino slowly coming out of that, we're still gonna have El Nino effects for the next three months, but eventually we will head towards that Enzo neutral phase. You can see the overall anomalies out there in the Equatorial Pacific. This is your uh, temperature anomalies just in the last seven days. Look at all that cooling underneath there. You can see the, weak, the, the, the El Nino is slowly weakening as we trend towards that spring time frame and the climate prediction center did actually start to reflect that on their january the 11th update and they will be doing another update on february the 8th but you can see the trend line here we were predominantly in an el nino all winter long through the fall through through winter right now but as we trend towards that springtime, all systems go as we transition into a more of an Enzo neutral type phase. And then eventually, whenever you get that flush out effect from an El Nino down here to that transitional phase coming out of El Nino, even in La Nina going in towards neutral, those are always more active time as far as like severe storms. So I am expecting an above average severe weather season coming out of that El Nino going into more of that Enzo neutral phase as we hit that March, April, May, June time frame. And then look what happens beyond that. The trend continues and there is a higher probability now by the time we hit summer, it's a likelihood going into July, August, and September that we are in, in fact, a La Nina by then as we go towards summer so it's a rapid transition folks for the next six months so between now and then this is what's happening right so this is what's going to happen you get the massive surge you get the rebound effect the temperature anomalies for the next seven days as the as the ridge and the polar vortex starts to lift back up into the arctic and then it becomes strong right so that puts everything under the lower 48 well above average and that's exactly what's going to happen and you put, see those extreme anomalies really kind of highlighted over the upper great lakes and into most of canada but look where all the cold air is right highlighted over greenland and highlighted over alaska 
right? So typically when you have Alaska extreme cold into, uh, into Greenland extreme cold, that typically puts the lower 48 into above average temperatures. And that's exactly what's gonna happen during the course of the next seven days. And yes, Alaska gets extreme cold. In fact, Fairbanks was the first time they hit 40 below zero. It's been a while. It's been 743 days for them. So even for them, they haven't actually seen the extreme cold. And this is the longest street even dating back all the way since they started keeping that type of record since 1930. So they are gonna get cold. In fact, they actually get colder throughout the course of this week over the next seven days through the end of January. They bottom out somewhere around the end of January. Look into these temperatures. Yeah, they could get upwards to the low 50s, mid 50s, upper 50s, even one spot, maybe 60 below zero up there. It's just dangerously bitter cold temperatures locks over Alaska. But then now let's take a look at the Pacific, all right? So we still got the atmospheric river and it's going to be a funnel effect. So we've got the systems that will be impacting the West Coast, but then the, mainly the Pacific Northwest along the coastal regions. But once we get into that February time slot, look at all the abundance amount of moisture surge that's ready to come ashore across the West Coast. At the same time, we're slowly going to start to see some of the demise and some of that dislodging of that colder air up, up into Alaska. If we look at the overall big picture on the 500 millibar, you can actually kind of see that as the ridge will slowly start to erode, right? What it's, it's a slow effect. It's not a rapid thing. It's a slow effect as some of that colder air starts to get pulled down as you get more of that active subtropical jet starts to take over look at the blue line here trying to drag down that colder air and eventually that will win out eventually as we get into that first week of february and especially that second week of february so if we if we take you through the bigger picture as far as the temperature anomalies you can see the transition once we hit that february the fourth that first week of that february fourth time slot we start to see the erosion of all the colder air up in Alaska. Look what happens now. Now you're talking above average temperatures. So you get the slow release out of that bitter cold air and it starts to shift southbound. Taps into that more subtropical jet stream. So you put all the West Coast areas inundated with very heavy rain and well below average temperature anomalies. And eventually, this will start to shift eastbound as the ridge will start to retreat back up into Canada, going into that deeper into that first week of, of a February time slot. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot going on here, right? So let's, uh, let's uh, delve into this deeper and look at the overall precipitation anomaly. So as that jet stream, as the atmospheric river starts to impact the West Coast, Look where all the above average rains pummel, right? So you got the well above average, you got the two, three upwards, almost 400% above average for this time of year. As the colder air starts to drain, you still got the ridge highlighted across much of the central and eastern two thirds. So that puts the drier slot during that, those first couple of days of February time slot. But then all that I think starts to change as we get deeper into that February, that first week of February. So you look at the active, more active subtropical jet, you got all the abundance amount of moisture coming in, complements of that, those atmospheric river events pummeling the, the West Coast. And then look where all the green starts to show up on the map across the central part of the US. So definitely the concern would be, right? You got more rain impacting those middle of the country up there in Iowa where the, all that snow, if there's any, the combination of all the rain and then the snow melt that you're gonna get over the next week or two, then you got another influx of moisture coming in that first week of February. And at the same time, that subtropical jet is going to be fairly low by then pulling in some of that colder air 
and look how low it gets folks it gets pretty low and this is typically for those areas further south is whenever when you're going to be maybe seeing some wintery precipitation this is the time slot you typically have a lot more climate to logically favored areas to see it and especially when you have a more active subtropical jet during an el nino and you've got west coast precipitation so you've got colder air draining in from the north and you've got west coast disturbances coming in that's typically a little bit more favorable almost more prime time setups if you are going to get wintery precipitation down here in the deep south those places like in texas and oklahoma and arkansas and louisiana and getting into the southeast and i would think eventually the carolinas that's we as we get in that second half of february this is typically the setup that you typically would like to see uh, unfold if you're looking for you know wintery precipitation that's the overall you know european ensembles this is the gfs ensembles because so it kind of implies the same way so you got that more active lowering the of the jet stream and then as we go deeper into that second week of february towards that valentine's day yeah look what happens again complete opposite we start to see the ridge start to lift back up into canada by then and look who's warm greenland's above average and look what alaska happens right well above average and that puts much of the country into the lower 48 with all those below average temperatures so winter is not done folks it's going to take a little bit of reprieve but it will be coming back i don't think we get as extreme cold as we came from back when montana hit 55 below zero when dallas hit 10 and something like that i don't think we've seen i've seen i think we've seen the coldest temperatures we've seen this winter in in, in those type areas in much of the country overall for the lower 48 so i do feel it gets colder but not as extreme cold but if you're a wintery precipitation lover if you're a snow lover you definitely you, you, sometimes you really don't want that arctic air because a lot of times arctic air is dry air and it tends to dry the atmosphere out and shuts off the trop tropical jet i think what's coming is definitely cold and it's going to be a strong cold front but i don't think it's extreme cold and i don't think it's arctic type cold and we'll be you know we'll be well above average precipitation during these time slots as well as below average temperatures and even on the gfs ensembles and implies the same way so we're always we're getting those two global congruent models in the extended range showing that rapid transition of that colder air coming out of alaska as we head into that first week of february but then extending to a good part to the lower 48 getting those areas that across the east coast as well as we get towards that second week of february and especially into that second half of february so that's kind of an overview of what's to come what i feel like what's to come over the next couple of weeks so guys i appreciate you guys uh, watching do like this video definitely hit the subscribe button and catch the next update why i protect you before and after the storm